Hey everyone, welcome to The Drive Podcast. I'm your host, Peter Atia. Hey Celia, thanks for making time on a Friday evening to uh, to sit down and talk about ketamine and perhaps a few other things, uh, but great to meet you. You too, thanks. It's my pleasure. Um, so let's talk a little bit about your background because I know that you... I think you finished your graduate training in the UK, but then you, you did a stint here in the US at Yale, if I'm not mistaken, correct? Yeah. Um, so I did my undergraduate in psychology with pharmacology and astrophysics for a bit. <laughs> but um, then I went, I did a PhD program at, at University College London. But as part of that, I spent some time at Yale and I'd got a scholarship to do a little bit of research out, out there in the US. So what did you focus on during your PhD? Um, so my PhD was largely focused on the effects of ketamine. Um, and back then, you know, that was in the, uh, makes me feel quite old, but nearly 20 you know, years ago, um, we were looking both at the acute effects of ketamine as a model of psychosis. So at the time, people were using ketamine with the idea that would help us understand the neurobiological underpinnings of psychosis, because actually... From the outside, ketamine looks quite a little bit similar to people who are psychotic. Um, and so we were using that to map the kind of cognitive processes in um, altered by ketamine. But I was also simultaneously looking at people who take ketamine recreationally, because at the time that was quite a big problem in the UK. Um, so yeah, I had this kind of dual focus. And when I went to the US, it was to work on, again, some neuroimaging studies um, looking at ketamine as a model for psychosis. So it was before it really became established as an antidepressant. So let's talk a little bit about the history of ketamine. It was synthesized in the 60s, I believe, correct? Yeah, so it was synthesized as an anesthetic by Parker Davies, um, who it was synthesized as a replacement for PCP or phencyclidine, um, because Obviously, people know PCP as angel dust, and there's this kind of folklore around it of people running at the police and being shot down and keeping running. But I mean, really, the problems with it, it had this protracted psychosis-like effects that lasted for a really long time following anesthesia. It was still a good analgesic anesthetic. But they synthesized ketamine as a similar molecule. So it still worked on the same receptor in the brain, the NMDA receptor, but it was 10 times, 10 times less potent. Um, and yeah, so it was synthesized back in the 60s and, and the drug company that synthesized it were initially really impressed by its analgesic and anesthetic effects. But then with increasing clinical experience, it was noticed that people were coming around from ketamine anesthesia reporting a variety of quite weird effects. So things like hallucinations and out of body experiences. And that's what's really limited its routine clinical use, but it's still one of the most widely used anesthetics in the world today. It's on the World Health Organization list of essential medicines. So, yeah, I mean, one yeah. of the one of the things that I remember from my clinical training was that the you know one of the perks of ketamine was that you didn't have the respiratory depression, and most things that we use as anesthetic agents have this problem where if you overshoot them, and that's not an issue if you're doing general anesthesia because you have an endotracheal tube in the bronchus and uh, in the main stem bronchus. So you're breathing for the patient. But when you start to think about conscious sedation, respiratory mm -hmm. depression starts to become a very frightening consequence that must be managed closely. And with ketamine, you didn't have that. Now, is my memory correct that kids were less susceptible to the hallucinogenic effects? Or like I literally, this is because I didn't do any, much in pediatrics, but I, I can't recall if there was more flexibility in using it with kids or am I making that up? No, I think, I mean, it is used more with children. Um, I don't know. That's the thing I've, we tried to do a study actually, which never really came off, but I don't know if it's that people haven't asked kids mm. if they're hallucinating or maybe they have more, they're just more. It's um, more, it's, it, it seems happens. less foreign to them if they are. Yeah, maybe. yeah, exactly. Yeah. They are yeah. tripping all the time, <laughs> but no, maybe <laughs> not that, but they're more open to like changes in consciousness. So yeah, I think they certainly seem to, I mean, it's used routinely, whether I, I, I'm really interested and I don't think anyone's really actually asked children <laughs> about their experiences. Um, but yeah, it's definitely, I think it's used because it's so safe, you know, so in pediatrics and geriatrics, also in battlefield medicine, it was the most widely used anesthetic in the Vietnam War, for instance. Yep. Um, so it's used, yeah, as you said, it's really safe physiologically, 
um, as an anesthetic because it doesn't slow your breathing or your heart rate. Um, so when you've lost a lot of blood, it's good as well because it actually even vaguely increases your blood pressure. So, yeah, I think that's why it's a widely used anesthetic. It's a really good question about kids, though, and I don't think, I mean, I know there's some people trialing ketamine in its antidepressant use now with adolescents, so I'm sure we'll come so on we'll to that later. There. But yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and, and, and I'm glad you made that other point, by the way. It doesn't lower blood pressure. So now you talk about it being the perfect anesthetic in trauma and shock where those patients are hypovolemic, their blood pressure is already going down. You give them an mm -hmm. agent that if anything slightly acts like a vasopressor, raises blood pressure without the respiratory depression. I mean, in that setting, you can understand why it, it sort of became, uh, you know, a, a turning point in, in the field medicine of Vietnam. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the, Acute experience must be really unusual when you're in that setting, but I guess the dissociation. Yeah. <laughs> so like, I think there's an interesting study about looking at the interaction between those acute subjective effects when you're on a battlefield. But I mean, yeah, also, like, as you mentioned, not having to intubate people, that's why it's really popular in developing countries where you've got limited access, you know, to um, or ability to intubate patients, you know, so it's a really important medicine in anesthesia still. And I think that's something people forget. You know, with all the new um, developments with ket the use of ketamine. Yeah, it's really interesting when you go and imagine what surgery was like before ether. And, yeah. <laughs> you know, I mean, when you, I mean, that's just ridiculous. Um, and, and to think that anesthesia is something we've only had for about 140 years. Um, yeah, it's, it's so pretty a, crazy, isn't yeah, it? To, to imagine and a fascinating, a fascinating concept anyway and like when you lose consciousness and how you measure that you know there's different things on it and if use there's an index which will relies on some eeg to look at how your consciousness drops but i still don't think we really know you know what turns it on and off <laughs> but yeah that's probably another podcast so you mentioned that ketamine is is kind of an analog would you is it safe to say it's an analog of pcp um yeah so they're all under the class of arrow cyclohexamines um and so i think edward domino coined the term dissociative anesthetics to describe um, PCP and ketamine. And also people include nitrous oxide in that um, category. Latterly, so I think based on the fact that they kind of dissociate you from your body and are characterized by these out of body experiences, um, which can be quite helpful again, I think in an anesthetic use. Yeah, so they are, they are related compounds with, with similar, their main action is on the NMDA receptor. So let's talk a little bit about that. Let's assume that folks don't know um, what the uh, NMDA receptor is. They don't know what glutamate is. They don't know GAB. Like, let's just assume people are coming yeah. at this from a standpoint of not being completely up to speed on excitatory or inhibitory neurotransmitters. Mm -hmm. um, explain in, in some detail exactly how these neurotransmitters work and how other uh, neurons can amplify or attenuate the response of those and where ketamine fits into that? Um, sure. So I guess, well, do you jump in as well if I'm either going too slowly or too quickly? Um, but yeah, so uh, glutamate's the major excitatory neurotransmitter in the brain, and it's prevalent all across the brain. And one of the um, receptors that um, glutamate works at is the NMDA receptor. And the NMDA receptor, the n methyl aspartate receptor, is really important in a lot of our higher cognitive functions. So it's the kind of the fundaments of learning and memory, um, particularly a process in learning called long-term potentiation, which is where neurons that, or brain cells that activate at the same time are more like, then if, you, if they both activate, then they're more likely to activate in future. So it, it's characterized by this term that someone said, neurons that fire together, wire together. And glutamate is really important in that. And other, you know, excitatory, functions in the brain. And GABA is an inhibitory neurotransmitter, so it um, slow, shuts down the flow of electrical impulses across the brain. What ketamine does is- And, and before blocks... we do that, so just oh, to give sorry. some people some examples, right? So glutamate is excitatory, GABA is inhibitory. Um, yeah. We can give people a sense of like alcohol. You and I were talking before yeah. we started about you know GABA analogs that are meant to mimic alcohol. I mean, what are they doing? Why do people feel relaxed when they drink, it's the yeah. GABA potentiation. 
Um, when yeah. you look at things like benzodiazepines, they're working GABA. at GABA, <laughs> right? Yeah. So, um, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, so, and then are there things yeah. that, that we can, examples we can give people that work at uh, glutamate that are amplifying glutamate? We tend to focus more like, on the opposite, right? Yeah. So, like lamotrigine, so drugs used in seizures mm. um, tend to re reduce the flow of glutamate and the brain, particularly in the prefrontal cortex. I'm trying to think of examples. It's a good question, Peter. Do you know of any? No, I can't think of anything off the top of my <laughs> yeah. head that, that would do that. Because again, we normally are thinking of the opposite side of that. So alcohol increases GABA in the brain, and that has the effect of kind of dampening down your brain activity and reducing things like anxiety and slowing your motor function and generally inhibiting the flow of electrical impulses across your brain. And then it's part of the reason why we get um, the symptoms you get when you stop drinking, your brain kind of goes into a, a more hyper, it's like a seesaw, I guess. So the alcohol has been pushing down on that side and keeping it dampened down. And then you release that and you go into kind of a more excitatory state. And so you get things like, and, and, and you know, because I work a lot with alcoholics, so things from alcohol withdrawals, you can get seizures and the shakes, and that's all down to this kind of increase in excitation. So, so that's why, that's why um, withdrawal from strong GABA uh, promoters like benzos and ethanol can be fatal if not managed yeah. correctly. You can't, you know, it's, it's sort of funny. I think people intuitively sort of know this, right? Like you can stop opioids immediately and it might be the most painful thing in the world, but it won't be fatal. Whereas mm. if you take a person who's on a high dose of benzodiazepines or a person who drinks a lot of alcohol and you stop that abruptly, it actually can be fatal. And they are the drugs you can die from withdrawal in because of these huge then increase in excitation. Because I guess with you know, repeated alcohol use, your brain gets used to having all this GABA on board and then you get adaptation and your brain kind of upregulates to counteract that. And then when you remove it, yeah, you can die from withdrawal. So the people I work with, um, you know, severe alcoholics, it's unsafe for them to stop straight away. So they have to cut down and use things like benzodiazepines and withdrawal. So yeah, it's um, yeah, it's something that I think people do think about opiate withdrawal potentially as a really difficult thing. But as you say, you wouldn't die from that. It's only from withdrawal from um, these inhibitory substances like alcohol and benzodiazepines. So, so, so then, so, so, okay. So we have excitatory and inhibitory neurons and the inhibitory neurons, are they the ones where you have like an NMDA receptor that is sort of globbed on to a, say a glutamate receptor? Yeah, that's, that's one of the theories of how ketamine works basically. Or were we just talking about the neurons? <laughs> Sorry, well, yeah, no, no, but you're right. Yes. Ketamine. I'm going exactly to now going like to uh, different ideas. Cause, cause I think they're really, it's not a hundred percent clear exactly how ketamine works. Correct? No, no. And so there's a couple of theories that either ketamine blocks directly, um, the NMDA receptors on the glutamatergic neurons. And then this triggers a kind of downstream cascade. Or, I mean, there's some evidence, and maybe it's a combination of the two. And this was, you know, but is that, that ketamine blocks um, NMDA receptors on these, they're called GABAergic interneurons. So they're your GABA receptor neurons that synapse onto your glutamate ones. So they they put the brakes on your excitation. Um, so they, they, so if you block an NMDA receptor on a GABAergic interneuron, then you're gonna have a net effect of increasing glutamate mm -hmm. flow in your presynaptic cells, so they're presynaptic. Um, so yeah, it's not quite clear and it probably is a combination of the two. Um, it's, I think increasingly people have become interested in the downstream mechanisms really, and potentially in the therapeutic effects of ketamine, but I expect we'll get to that later. <laughs> yeah, so, so again, ketamine is one of these drugs where the dose kind of makes the poison. I mean, I think that's true of most drugs, but it really has different effects on an individual based on how much they're getting, right? And yeah. you know, anything from kind of like mild hypnosis to some dissociation to complete an is you know, complete anesthesia. Yeah, absolutely. No, and at low doses as well, people, you know, I work quite a lot with people who take ketamine non-medically or recreationally and they at lower doses it's got kind of stimulant properties. And then as the dose increases, you get kind of just uh, perceptual distortions and illusions and kind of a mild melting people talk about floating 
higher doses still, you get kind of much more profound, maybe not hallucinations, but changes in re- the perception of reality. And the highest dose, you're completely sort of catatonic, but people are experiencing inside these really, really profound um, hallucinations. And that, I mean, it's those really high doses from my work with, you know, non-medical ketamine users that were actually really dangerous. A couple of people died from taking ketamine, you know, and then having a bath and they're completely dissociated from reality and they drowned. And it's like the saddest thing. And it makes you, I think as a, as a user, the ketamine users are very vulnerable to accidents at these higher doses because you are com- not completely dissociated from reality, really. Wow. So that's sort of like LSD in the sense where it really has no LD50, meaning you can't, there's no amount of LSD that you're going to take that is going to create some physiologic process that kills you the way, for example, Tylenol, acetaminophen, you know, Mm. would, you know, poison your liver at a certain dose. But it's not to say that LSD is completely safe because you can alter your behavior in a way that is so altered from reality that you put yourself in harm's way. And you're saying, Basically, is that the same with ketamine? That if you yeah. look at it from a purely pharmacology standpoint, there's no LD50, given that it doesn't have respiratory depression and all these other things that we worry no. about? Or how do you think about that? Yeah, no, I mean, I think there's very few. Yeah, um, it's much the cases I'm not aware of anyone are getting to like a toxic dose of ketamine. And um, there are problems with, you know, repeatedly taking high doses of ketamine. And which have been uncovered in work with abusers, but yeah, it's um and, and physiological problems. The ketamine has a direct toxicity on the epithelial, so like the lining of your bladder, um, which is really interesting. It's something that only emerged really with people using really high doses. But yeah, there's no LD50, like you say. I think it's um it's more how and I'm much more so probably even than LSD, where a lot more of your kind of top down higher cognitive functions are preserved. Mm-hmm. With ketamine, they're not, and you are completely, you know, catatonic. People will be kind of collapsed, um, anesthetized, really, in a cataleptic state. So you're much more vulnerable to accidents and, yeah, through that. The, uh, the, the drowning in a bathtub example, that seems tragic. And to imagine yeah. how dissociated you would have to be to slip into a bathtub, inhale water, and yeah. not respond. Yeah, exactly. You are com- you are completely dissociated. And it's really sad. It was someone that I was working with. And that, it's not the only example. I know of a few case studies or, or examples of people who that's happened to, various different accidents. So, yes, yeah, it's, it's, it's really tragic, as you say. Um, well, yeah. While we're on the pharmacology, let's talk about the different routes of administration. I assume that most of the time when it's used medically, it's intravenous. Yeah, that's um most of the studies, um certainly in the depression field and when it's used in anesthesia, I think people would give it intravenously. It's the best by availability and the most well characterized route, um. But yeah, or route as you say in American, um. But um, there are other ways of administering it, you know, which I think have been increasingly used. Intramuscular has got quite good availability in the blood and then there's people starting to use things like sublingual administration so putting under the tongue um intranasal obviously is the route popularized by first the drug users themselves but then patented by um the pharmaceutical company Janssen have now used that for their licensed form of ketamine and depression um yeah and those are the main ones and and oral dosing Although it's, that's not as great in terms of bioavailability, it's obviously an easy way to get a drug over and across into the system. But yeah, you're right. I think. And, and there's no hepat. There's no. There's no liver toxicity. With I know you're going to have a bad first pass effect, which is why you yeah, prefer to put it pass. under your tongue as opposed to to swallow it. Yeah. But, um, but there's no toxicity. It just means you need a higher dose if you're going to take it orally, presumably. Yeah, I think. I mean, it's not that well characterized. I don't know whether I don't. I I assume people are doing the toxicity studies at the moment because I know there's some pharmaceutical companies looking at oral Mm -hmm. dosing as a potential. But I think for the purpose of our discussion, we're really thinking about what has been learned through intravenous and intramuscular and perhaps most recently intranasal. Yeah, and that's where the bulk of the research is for sure. Okay. So... Uh, in the 1970s, when this drug was being used pretty liberally as an anesthetic, it was was it unscheduled in the United States? I know now it's a Schedule Three, so it is you know it's a much more regulated compound. But is that? Yeah, I think it only 
came oh, when was it in the US? I think maybe 1996. Yeah, I think it was it the was, late yeah, it's 90s. relatively recent. Yeah. yeah, late 90s, 2003, Putin banned it in Russia. Just banned Entirely, it all even together. For use, yeah. yeah, even for use in humans. And quite an interesting story. Brigitte Bardot, obviously the very attractive French actress, petitioned him for to use it in animals because it's obviously widely used in veterinary anesthesia. So he removed the ban for animals, but kept the ban in place for humans, which is pretty horrendous considering what an amazing anesthetic it is. I mean, the UK, it became, it was 2006. So yeah. And, it, and in the UK, it mirrors basically the US um, regulation around our equivalent of C3. Yeah, ours is class B, okay. ketamine. So yeah, it's under the misuse of drugs scheduling, but it's um, it's obviously what we call, you know, a scheduled two drugs they use for medical use. But unlike, I mean, maybe it's something we'll get into whether you consider ketamine to be a psychedelic drug, but there's not any other drugs with these kind of type of effects that can be used medically that are legal. So that that's right. So in the United States, the other <clears throat> psychedelics, LSD psilocybin and even mdma which is not a psychedelic are schedule one which means they are not even used yeah. they have no medical use at all yeah and that's i mean it's interesting drug policy wise right because ketamine is the most likely to be abused i would say of all of those compounds <laughs> but it's the one that's you know legal for medical use i mean it has as we've said got an amazing number of medical uses but you don't and, consider and, and mdma could, psychedelic <laughs> I mean, I don't think I'm an expert to say, but no, I, I don't consider MDMA a psychedelic personally. Uh, no. Uh, I, I sort of put it in the category of an empathogen and because um, mm. you don't really have any dissociation with it, right? You know, it's not it's not altering perception in the way that LSD or psilocybin uh, would. Uh, and, and your yeah. point is an interesting one, right? Which is, you know, schedule one typically implies no medical use, high potential for addiction. Well, mm. Uh, certainly, uh, I think there's medical use for psilocybin and MDMA, as you said, pretty low potential for abuse. And interestingly, while ketamine clearly has a high medical use, I want to talk to you about the potential for abuse as well. Mm -hmm. um, I've heard mixed things on this, but what, what do the data say? How, how addictive is ketamine in terms of other things for which we have benchmarks, like, for example, benzodiazepines? and opioids, where we, we really have a clear sense of the addictive potential of those molecules. Where does ketamine stack up? Um, well, I don't know if we have really good data on that, but I would say, I mean, in terms of physical withdrawals symptoms, I mean, it depends how you assess mm -hmm. the addictive properties, right? So there's the initial high, um, there's, yeah, and how you how you really categorize that. Because I guess I would say I struggle with things being addictive. People become addicted to things, um, sure. but they're also you yeah, know, yeah. multifunctional C tools. Coffee's that... addictive or whatever. and Yeah. yeah. Um, but I would say, I mean, we did a study of people that use ketamine, so they're probably at higher potential for abuse. Um, if they might say people who use ketamine non-medically, as in what you would say recreationally, I think about nine percent of them had symptoms of some sort of dependence or craving nine percent um, so nine percent of a group of like recreational users of drugs so i'm finding that hard to benchmark that, that against opioids and benzos i mean that's like for me is a bit lower so so i'll tell you i mean the last time i looked at the opioid data and and someone listening to this will probably say no that's wrong um <laughs> because i'm going by memory my memory was about 20 percent of opioid users became addicted but that was mm. prescription-based opioid painkillers right that, that doesn't include heroin where that number might be higher but of course you're also pre-selecting a different sub subgroup of the population so it's not really an apples to apples comparison in other words yeah, what i'm saying right. is of you know, 20% of patients who would be prescribed opioids for medical use, you know, could could become addicted, which is a staggering number, right? One in five people who gets mm -hmm. an opioid prescription could go on to abuse them later. You know, so I, I don't know that, how much faith to put in that number because it seems so absurdly yeah. high, but it's, you know, it's plausible. And I guess, so the only way we would really know this, I suppose, on an apples to apples basis is you took patients who were being treated with ketamine for another indication such as recalcitrant mm. depression and you ask the question how many of those patients would go on to experience dependency pharmacologic physiologic yeah. dependency yeah yeah and that um we know is 
I mean, so far the data suggests it's pretty low, like what's not really seen at all. Okay. So we know that a little bit from the trials that have gone on so far, but it's a really early stage. And I guess if you're doing apples to apples, you know, opioids is that daily, like, or, or benzos, I don't know, like yeah. frequency. Also how you're defining addiction is quite hard because if it's physical withdrawal symptoms or is it impacting on your everyday functioning or is it non-seeking beyond your prescription dose escalation? There's a, yes, it's a, it's a tricky one. I, don't, I mean, I know from having worked with ketamine, people who are addicted to ketamine, that some, as a small proportion of people do become addicted. And for those, you know, as, as we mentioned, it has these really serious physical consequences of having um, toxicity on your bladder. You know, I was working with people, 16 year old girls who've had their bladders had to have a cystectomy. So you have your bladder removed and then they're, you know, having to wear a colostomy bag, like really dire consequences. And I think that's quite rare. I was thinking about other drugs that have got like a direct physiological. So just to make sure I understand. So these are 16 year old girls that were not using ketamine for a medical indication, such as depression. No, they became no, no, addicted no. to it recreationally. Yeah. And this was kind of an epidemic in the UK in the 90s, early 2000s. when we were researching it because people didn't really know anything about ketamine. So, so the nickname was, I mean, I was in, I was in medical school in the 90s and I, we learned about it as Special K, right? That's what it was yeah. referred to. So now that, yeah. I don't know if that was the San Francisco name because that's sort of where I was going to school. And I don't know if it, was it called Special K in the UK also? Yeah, I think people called it that. Um, some people, you know, it was very, the, the, so these people that I was working with were very constrained to sense subcultures. So we have kind of these travelers, they're like um, people who live itinerant lives. You know, I don't know if you have something equivalent in, in the US. <laughs> so it was amongst those groups. Um, some of them called it kiddie smack, basically saying it's like an addictive drug like it was basically like heroin for kids i see so it's kind of the jv or junior version of of heroin yeah. not quite as bad but yeah for those people but there was there was zero information about it at the time and and they were not taking the drug the way it's given you know for depression they were taking grams and grams of it every day so these serious something important to say and what would what, what would they experience i mean grams of this i have we'll, we'll come back and do the math on what that means but if they're yeah. taking high doses of this stuff daily, were they taking it and then basically passing out in their apartments for hours and just dissociating on trips? And No, I mean, they would be, so a dose that would render someone completely, yeah, catatonic, cataleptic, would be, they would just tolerate it because it is, the tachyphylaxis is like the rapidly developing tolerance. And if you do administer ketamine repeatedly in a short time window, you do need to give higher and higher doses. I think that's what we found, like with these people, they were going, they were functioning, you know, walking around on doses that, yeah, would floor, you know, an elephant or certainly a horse. <laughs> um, so, yeah, it's it pretty, it was pretty extraordinary. I'm quite, and I think I do feel, yeah. So with, 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 with the opioids, we kind of have a sense of what that high is that the, that the person using it is experiencing, right? That mu receptor when it is, uh, you know, agonized, it, um, it, it produces a, a very deep high. What is the feeling that that person is getting from those escalating doses of ketamine, even once they're tachyphylactic? What, what, is, what do they say that they're experiencing that is bringing them back to it? Yeah, it's a really good question. And I think it's not one thing. We actually did some research on this. I think we spoke to about 120 ketamine users doing some interviews of why they took it. Um, and some of them did. So some of them said very pragmatic things, I think, because it's very cheap. So things like it's cheap, it gets me really off my head. I think at the escapism of it, mm. you know, they, but there is, I mean, there's some new receptor, there's some slight opioid actions of ketamine. Maybe we can come on to that. We're talking about the different isomers of ketamine. But yeah, so some people are taking it just for the escapism. Some people talk more as we'd see them kind of psychonauts, but almost addicted to chasing the consciousness and the insights they felt they were getting and they were just taking more and more to try and get more insights. I mean, there's some really, you know, high profile examples of that. I don't know if you've heard of John Lilly, who was the kind of neuroscientist based in California. Okay. Um, and he, uh, the film Altered States is about him and he did quite a lot of unusual research, you know, giving LSD to dolphins. Um, he invented flotation tanks, I think. Um, and he, writes in his book, The Scientist, 
clearly documents becoming completely addicted to ketamine to the extent that he was having an intravenous drip of ketamine, you know, pretty much 24 hours a day. So he really heavily escalated his dose and became kind of psychotic, I think. And well, he had these revelations and went to tell the president of the, well, the president of the USA <laughs> but you're, um, about the world being taken over by computers. Um, but yeah, so, I mean, it's a really fascinating book if you're interested in reading an account of ketamine addiction. And and how did that story end for him? What what is the? Well, I, I think he managed. To, did he manage to get off ketamine? In the end, I'm trying to remember. That's a really good question. I can't remember the end of it. I know there's some sad end. There was another book called Journey to the Bright World by someone called Marsha Moore. I think she was an heiress to some her husband, to some kind of fortune, and but her husband was an anaesthetist, and she experimented with ketamine. It's actually quite interesting. They are very different subjective experiences so John Lilly's one's very machine state and he's experiencing hallucinations very related to being in a computer and hers were very soft and round and going back to the earth but she sadly I think froze to death she took some ketamine outside and um, again that thing where you are completely dissociated in your um yeah from your body and she'd gone outside one evening and actually froze to death that's really sad I mean I don't they were people taking really high intravenous doses of ketamine, um, but yeah, it's it's got a it's it's got a rapidly developing tolerance. And, and why is it different? So PCP, uh, I'm I'm trying to think. I don't really think I took care of any patients that were strung out on PCP, but I certainly remember the lore of the drug, and it was mm. it struck me as a much more aggressive drug. Uh, people that were on PCP, as you alluded to earlier. They seemed almost bulletproof, right? They'd punch their hand through a, a glass window, be unfazed by the fact that they just broke every bone in their hand. Um, given mm. that these drugs have such a similarity, why why did PCP seem to produce that phenotype? Or is that just lore and that really wasn't what was happening? <laughs> yeah, I think that's lore. I mean, I think it produced a protracted psychotic state, but some people have likened it. I think they gave the police nets even to catch people on PCP. So there was a lot of kind of police brutality, these special PCP nets. Police brutality is associated with PCP and maybe the people taking PCP, some people have suggested it's kind of a degree of racism or um, against kind of people in poverty. So yeah, I don't, I've been looked for examples of this kind of bulletproof phenomena in, and I can't find any mm -hmm. in the literature, certainly. Uh, there's definitely examples of people having a protracted sort of psychotic like symptoms, having hallucinations, having to be hospitalized. But this whole running at police and the kind of violence aspect, I find hard to imagine. And, and is PCP still being used? Is it still a, a, a street drug? It's certainly not. It's never really been a street drug in, in the UK. I don't, I, I'm not aware there's many reports okay. in the US either. So it's interesting. And it's interesting in the context of the new use of all these substances. Nobody's really thinking about using PCP, but maybe that would be something <laughs> to investigate. So speaking of kind of the resurgence of these drugs, how would you contrast ketamine with psilocybin and LSD? So psilocybin and LSD, of course, are much more similar to each other. How does mm. ketamine differ? I mean, obviously it differs in use case, but do you have yeah. other senses of how it, how it, how it produces a, a different experience? Yeah, I mean, obviously it has completely different action where they yeah. work on the 5-HT2A receptor and ketamine, as we were talking about, works on these kind of glutamatergic receptors. And there are some similarities in the acute experience, which is one of kind of, a, a, people talk about ego dissolution and yep. ketamine causes that quite profoundly. So you lose your sense of self and that happens to a degree as well on psilocybin, um, so much mushrooms and LSD. I think you get much that you can think more clearly on LSD and psilocybin. Ketamine impairs some of your higher cognitive functions mm. and causes that kind of analgesia, which is associated with ketamine's got an anxiolytic effect. So even at higher doses, people don't report anxiety. Whereas, I mean, they can d describe things. So some of our patients describe things that sound scary, but they don't feel the kind of physiological anxiety. Um, whereas, you know, drugs like LSD, psilocybin, people can report be being absolutely terrified by the experience. And I think maybe that's the dissociation that happens more on drugs like ketamine, where you really have the sense of being separate um, and everything's kind of at 
emotionally numb um, as I guess you'd think with it being an analgesic or an anesthetic. And that might be due to the, in, the, the greater inhibitory effect potentially of ketamine is probably why you maybe can short circuit some of the anxiety that can definitely happen with LSD and psilocybin if the setting isn't yeah. right or if the dose is too high. Yeah. And so that, I mean, it's, and that's probably when you we were talking before about the, you know, the abuse potential, maybe why it's got higher abuse potential because. That's right. It has less of a negative feedback loop. I think anybody who's tried the other psychedelics will say, look, if you, if you go back to the well too many times, you're, you, you can, you can, you can get stung. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's unpredictable in that sense. Um, whereas ketamine and that, if you're looking for kind of escapism, you don't want to escape into absolute terror. <laughs> so, <laughs> well, yeah. said. all right. So let's, let's talk about depression because I think this is where people are really becoming interested in ketamine. It, it's certainly how it came to my attention seven, eight, maybe nine years ago was, um, God, I'm trying to think how it was a, it was a, a physician friend of mine saying, Hey, I, you know, he was saying he's been prescribing intranasal ketamine to some of his patients for depression. And I thought, none of this makes sense. Please say more. Um, and he said, yeah, no, this is, it's perfectly legal. We, you know, I have a compounding pharmacy and these are the instructions that we give the pharmacy and they give him an intra, you know, they give the patient an intranasal spray and they use this spray. I forget the frequency with which it was like one spray. They were doing it once a week or something was the, the, the use case. Um, and at the time, again, this is maybe 10 years ago, I couldn't find a lot of literature on it. And, and, you know, I found some, uh, and I found some interesting case reports and I found, I remember there was one study I found based in India that looked pretty interesting. Um, but then I sort of forgot about it until maybe four years ago. And, um, and I think what brought it back to my uh, attention was, frankly, the uh, epidemic, for lack of a better word, of ketamine clinics, um, mm -hmm. which, which you know, basically are almost as ubiquitous as Starbucks now. So um, before we get into kind of the business of ketamine clinics, I, I want to just kind of understand where the where the idea came from. How was this something that people even thought was you know worth pursuing clinically, and then how does it work? Uh, who does it work in? Who does it not work in? You know, let's just go down the, the depression rabbit hole. Sure. Yeah. I mean, there's quite where it came from is probably, there was a really early study in Iran, I think. I mean, it might even date back to some quite dodgy work by Salvador Roque. I'm not sure if you've heard of him. Mm -mm. Yeah. His, um, he was a But I do want, I do yeah. want to compliment you on the use of dodgy. That word cannot ever be overused. So uh, any, anytime <laughs> oh, you want to so just throw in that that's a dodgy scam or that's it is just dodgy <laughs> sure. work, please, please feel free to insert that. <laughs> thank you. It's not a very scientific word, but no, thanks, no, it's, it, it belongs here. It belongs here. <laughs> Okay. Yeah. No. And he definitely was a dodgy guy. <laughs> so there we go. Um, he was a, he was working for the Mexican government, actually, I think interrogating people. And he took some of the techniques from that, I think, and tried to, he's a psychoanalyst kind of psychotherapeutic practice. And he was giving ketamine with other psychedelics um, to try and produce changes in people's brain state. But I guess that's probably the first documented cases of people using ketamine in a kind of psychiatric therapy sense. And this is what, this really is in the eighties or nineties? No, that was back in the sixties oh, wow. in, um, yeah. So way back, maybe the seventies, there was this study out of Iran. Um, but really, yeah, the work that's kind of caused this whole explosion in ketamine depression research, because I don't think anyone was really watching those areas of research came out of um, a group at Yale and a guy called Robert Berman. Um, who did, uh, did an early study in 2000 um, giving ketamine, a single ketamine infusion to patients with treatment-resistant depression. And they showed this thing which was kind of groundbreaking in that, and that's was that you could get this rapid reduction in um, depressive symptoms, not as our traditional SSRIs, you know, your the Prozacs and your traditional antidepressant drugs, I've got a delayed onset of action and it was just kind of accepted that they take two weeks to work. And, you know, there's various ideas of why, but um, this, this ketamine worked immediately and, and then people with treatment resistant depression. And, and so tell, me, mild tell me depression. how it was administered in those early studies. Was this, it, so that was, yeah. 
Sorry. No, so that was intravenous. Intravenous. Okay. Yeah. And what kind of doses were they using? That's 0.5 milligrams per kilogram. Yeah. So. 0.5. Okay. So an 80 kilogram person is getting 40 milligrams intravenous. Yeah, over 40 minutes. Yeah. Over 40 okay. minutes. So not an IV yeah. push, but a pretty quick drip. Yeah. So pretty quick, like mild dissociation, I would say, from my experience of using different doses and some kind of peripheral subjective changes. Um, so, yeah, we've used that, that dose in acute studies. And, and then just for reference, um, what would a recreational drug user who's not completely habituated, so they're not way up the tachyphylaxis curve, but if, if, if a recreational person went to their drug dealer and said, I want some ketamine because I want to blast off, what dose would they be given? That's really variable, I'd say, but maybe more on like at least 100, if not 200 milligrams, I would say. Got it. So they're going to be given two and a half to five times the dose that, and they would blast off with that. They would probably take that yeah, intramuscularly. Yeah, that would be a blast off. Yeah. Uh, no, people intranasally, I think, is the typical route for. Okay. And is the bioavailability uses. similar? I'm sure the onset is different if, with intranasal versus intravenous mm. versus intramuscular, but does the same amount of drug basically get to you with each of those routes? Yeah, slightly less than intravenous is obviously the optimal route yeah. for that. Mm -hmm. But yeah, it's a pretty good way to get it across, which is why it's now been taken forward as a treatment and depression, I guess. Okay, so so the, the so going back to this patient that's getting 40 milligrams. So it's a higher dose, I would say. That's a dose that they know something is happening. They're not getting a placebo, but it's mm. they're not being blown out of the water. No, I mean, I think it's really variable. Through all my work, I guess I must have given them like hundreds of people get them in in research studies and it is the response is really variable okay. and, and not necessarily predictive. So we weight adjust all of our doses. So so give me the range. What's the what's the sort of interquartile range? So there are are there some people that literally feel nothing at 0.5 MIGs per kg? I don't know that anyone would feel nothing, but maybe feel more like slightly drunk and feel a bit disoriented. Okay. You know, that kind of feeling, like intoxicated basically and slightly dissociated. And at the Those other end of the spectrum, be... are there people that are just yeah. tripping? People who are going, you know, people have gone down a canoe in their mother's eardrum, like doing really weird stuff, like having frank hallucinations basically, wow. like um, really extreme responses. And I think, I mean, we, we can talk about that in a bit. We've Found out a little about what predicts that, I think, now. Tell me. Yeah, I'm, I'm very curious because I, I just know myself with any single agent that I've ever ingested in my life, anything that ranges from alcohol to acetaminophen to, to, to a psychedelic agent, I'm, I need like three times what anybody else needs to feel it. <laughs> and I've always been curious as to why. It's just incredibly hard, Peter. <laughs> I'm so hardcore. No, I think um, so. The things that we um, the things that we found out from our research is that people with a family history of alcohol problems, they have a greater acute response to ketamine. They're more sensitive to it. Yeah. Okay. And well, they have a greater sorry, their greater response to the therapeutic effects. They've oh, actually oh, got see. less of a response to the acute. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I said that completely wrong. Okay. Um, and what are the other things? BMI which is kind of obvious, I suppose, is so higher BMI, um, body mass index, is um, predictive of a higher acute effect. Because they're, but that's because they're getting a higher dose. Yeah, in, well, in a way, but then the, I guess the BMI is, is slightly different. And I suppose maybe that's something to consider. It's similar with alcohol, right? Like your But that's not surprising. That, that's not surprising, fat. right? Because yeah. it would, because BMI really speaks to how much lean mass and non-lean exactly. mass you have. It doesn't really speak to your organs and it certainly doesn't speak to your brain. No, no, it doesn't speak to your brain. So no, these are really obvious things. I mean, and this is why we haven't got very far in predicting how people respond. Mm -hmm. um, and therapeutically, we know with depression, the more suicide attempts, people have a better response. So they're more likely wow. to respond, which probably maybe means they're more severe, I guess. Mm. Um, but yeah, we know not very much at all, really. There's some kind of... But the, so, so let me ask another question. Does the acute response that you are watching during the, call it two or three hours that they're in your chair being administered the drug, right? Because it's a 40 minute infusion. Presumably it's another couple of hours while they're under the effect of the drug. Mm -hmm. We call that the acute response. Is that mm. predictive of what you're really after, which is the... Um, the abatement of depression 
Yeah, that's a really good question. I think the field is pretty divided. So the way that the acute effects have typically been measured is with a scale called the Clinician Administered Dissociative State Scale, which basically looks at dissociation, but it was designed to look at dissociation from people having flashbacks from traumatic experiences. Mm. Um, so it asks some questions that are relevant for ketamine, but some that are not. So it's like, are, are things moving in slow motion? Have colors changed? Mm. Um, do you have a sense of forgetting chunks of what have happened? A lot of it is relevant, but people who've looked at other aspects of the acute experience. So with these dissociative effects, some studies, I'd say about 25% find they predict, predict the therapeutic effects. We've actually done a systematic review on this, um, but the others don't. And so I think there's a, this maybe, but I think in general psychiatry, there's a feeling that these acute effects are a nuisance and that we need to find, and there's a whole, you know, research effort has been devoted to, finding drugs that don't have these acute effects um, with kind of limited success. <laughs> um, so I don't know, I think, and actually when you look into the data, people who use a bit more nuanced ways of looking at the acute effects. So there's some scales that look at some of the bit more, I guess you'd say trippy effects and things like mystical experiences in the sense that the, you can't explain the experience that's gone on. And those do seem to predict. So it's quite interesting. Wow. It's, First of all, I mean, to just try to unpack that, it's not crystal clear that the person who's sitting there feeling slightly drunk is going to have a lesser outcome or a greater outcome than the person who's on the canoe in their mom's, you know, <laughs> eustachian <laughs> tube, right? <laughs> yeah. the, so the second point I would extract from what you said is we're probably using too crude an instrument to try to tease out exactly what effects in the acute phase matter. and. It's mm. either because we don't know what questions to ask them in that window, or we're not doing our analyses on a fine enough gradation of symptoms. Is that a fair assessment? Yeah, yeah, that's what I'm saying, basically. I think we need, you know, maybe a, a, a finer, more nuanced um, understanding of the effects. So we're doing some stuff now, just recording what people say and getting them to describe it, and then using artificial intelligence kind of machine learning algorithms to um, find patterns in that to see if that might predict wow. it. Because I mean, that seems like a, you know, a bit of a no brainer now that we've got quite a long way with just using natural language to predict outcomes. So and by the way, does ketamine produce amnesia? Um, yeah, it's got some amnesia, but people can remember the experience. It's not as, so you might forget aspects of what's happened and it certainly impairs your episodic memory, but people do remember the experience. So we do interviews with people about the salient points of the experience they'll remember. But I guess it's through a bit more of a fuzzy haze than maybe your classic psychedelics. Um, so a bit less accessible, I would say. The patient then, let's say after you've done this, the patient wakes up and it's three hours later, or wakes up is the wrong word, but the patient sort of returns back to their, their baseline state. Mm. Do they immediately feel the alleviation of the depression is that how quickly it can 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 onset people can feel just yeah quite considerably better a colleague of mine Rupert McShane he he set up the first NHS um treatment resistant depression clinic here in the UK and he likened it to the you know the film Awakenings which yes. is actually about Parkinson's but like these people are really severely depressed you know they often can't get off bed and that they suddenly come alive some people you know not everyone responds to it but yeah that's that it's pretty rapid and people just feel a kind of sense of clarity a bit more interest in the world i would say like the, the almost like you're able to detect novelty where you weren't before you know your attention yeah it's, it's quite a great thing to see what is the um mean and median duration of how long that lasts well yeah that's um again a really good question is around so i think people say I mean, and, and again, it's really variable. And obviously some people don't respond at all. So it's important to say that. What what fraction do not respond at all? I don't think we have a good handle on it, basically. We need more world, real world data. Because if you look at people in trials, it's, it's often very different. But I think it's around maybe I would say like 50, 50, 60%. Oh my God. I had no clue it was that high. So you're saying just call it 50%. Half the people that go through, so half the people that show up with completely treatment-resistant depression, 
and go through this experience under the well-controlled setting of the lab in a clinical trial mm. have no benefit from it. Yeah, I think that's what's happened over time. So the wow. early studies, so like Carlos Rate study, you know, it was 75%. And this typically happens with any new treatment, I think. They, as more and more studies come out, the rates of response reduce. So yeah, um, I would say, may, I mean, maybe, maybe I'm being overly conservative. Um, so I should probably have that figure to hand. Um, but I will say, I think the duration is probably about, you know, two days to a week um, often. And some people have longer, we'll have two weeks. But that's the bit where my research comes in really because we've been looking at how you might extend that response. And that's something that does seem to be coming out now. That If you give it alongside psychological therapy of some kind, um, you can really extend the response of the to ketamine and the antidepressant effects as well as so my trials have been looking at ketamine in the treatment of alcohol. Um, but we found still reductions in drinking six months following just three infusions. So Spaced by in, how far? Pardon? How far did you space those three infusions apart? Oh, they time? were between, between either a week or kind of up to two, two weeks, probably on average between them with seven sessions of psychological therapy. So quite a limited treatment program, really. So let, let's go back to this because this is sort of, sort of interesting, right? So, so we would say, let's say 50% of people that show up and let's define treatment resistant depression for somebody. Mm. Um, it's not defined by duration, is it? No, is not responding to it. So, and it's, I mean, it's a tricky one because it's defined differently depending on different trials. Often people define it as not responding to two conventional antidepressants um, in the current depressive episode um, or having had multiple different treatments. But yeah, so it's not defined as treatment. But there, I mean, some people take a more conservative definition of that to have maybe three failed response. So it is pretty variable in the trials. And, and depression is requires at least two weeks of the set of symptoms that we typically associate with depression. And, and it would it be classified as depression if there is an obvious externality? So loss of a child, you know, if your child yeah. died, and a month later, you can't get out of bed, is that considered depression? I mean, no, it, I mean what I mean by sadness. that is like, how does that get classified given that there's such a clear explanation for the why? Yeah, I think, I mean, if that continued for a really prolonged period of time, but then that even that in itself is maybe contentious because I guess, but yeah, but there's a clear boundary between, you know, grief, what's we would anticipate from grief and natural sadness okay, and then depression. So let, let's keep it this one sort of simple and say that this is not something that's clearly associated to a trigger such as grief, but instead mm. um, a, less ex, a less obvious to explain form of depression. It's been going on for at least a couple of weeks. Let's make it interesting and say it's been going on for months so that mm. this person has gone through one SSRI, they've taken it to a therapeutic dose, they've had no benefit. Mm. they've then progressed and moved to a different SSRI or a different class of drug, an SNRI or something like that. And similarly, mm -hmm. they're just not getting the benefit. Does it matter if, um, do, do we sort of assess how much psychotherapy they've been doing at the same time? It depends on the, um, so I mean, I'm just thinking about the clinical trials or the reasons we give for prescribing off-label ketamine here in the UK and um, typically it would be the antidepressants like not responding to two antidepressants but yeah you could say failed response to CBT I mean that's happened in in a lot of the trials they would have non-responders to CBT I know particularly some of the psilocybin studies but that's cognitive behavioral therapy yep okay so so now the person comes in and again we've just said 50 percent of those people are not going to respond and mm. that's pretty sad. So what are we saying to those 50% of people? It's, we, we, we're going to go back to trying more and more conventional therapies, or do we say we should try this again? And maybe the second time we use a higher dose or something like that. Yeah. Because some people, there's some evidence that people take maybe three, this is in depression. Um, maybe we'll take, it might not respond to actually three ketamine doses, but maybe the fourth one. They, there's some evidence that having an extra beyond three doses might increase the response. I mean, certainly the unlabeled ketamine, which is the Spravato, this is the Janssen version of ketamine, which is intranasal. And um, that's indicated, you know, for repeated dosing, 
So you start out twice weekly, I think it's for a month, and then move to weekly. Um, and what they're finding with the long-term studies is that people are staying on the dose. I think there was an idea that people might, you know, progress off or drop down to, I think they dropped down to fortnightly, um, but they're staying on it for a number of years now, I think, um, is the kind of long-term data. So it is a maintenance. So the plan is to keep people on ketamine or like, let's go back to somebody who responded. So let's go back to a patient who's... Um, De depression is profound and they've been through all the treatments and nothing's worked. They do their first uh, ketamine infusion and they feel remarkably better mm. and, and it lasts four days. And then mm. all of a sudden the depression sets back in. Is the, is the thinking that we're going to repeat this treatment and get longer and longer periods of um, benefit during which mm. time we can work more on psychotherapy uh, to, to try to, you know, wean off the need for ketamine. Yeah. I mean, that would be my thinking. And that's some people's thinking, I think, is that targeting the therapy during that time, um, is, is really important if you don't want to keep someone on ketamine as a maintenance dose. By the way, do patients need to stop their traditional antidepressants when they are t coming to these trials? So if the patients, cause most of them are probably on SSRIs and mm. not doing well, do you at least mm. get to keep them on that? Yeah. I mean, we, in our trial, we were, our funding body, which is the, like the UK state didn't want us to include people on SSRIs, but actually most of the studies, the depression studies, people are still on them and there's no interaction. So it's not like some of the other novel substances like psilocybin where you'd, because they're, it's working in a completely different way in the brain. So, yeah. so to, there's no sense. So I mean, why, you probably wouldn't be responding to them, I guess. What, what, what do you think is the mechanism of action? Oh, yeah. So, I mean, that's where I think potentially the therapy and targeting the therapy is really important. I mean, people have talked about ketamine and and indeed the other psychedelics, the psychoplastogens. I'm not sure about the term, but maybe the idea that they provoke this kind of cascade and the studies showing they increase synaptic plasticity in the, in the prefrontal cortex, which certainly ketamine does. Um, so increases the growth of new synapses and um, the dendrites. And so the, basically the ability of the brain to form new connections and that that is correlated with um, the antidepressant effect. Um, and so we kind of want to, we're doing some work at the moment to sort of chart the time course of that in humans by looking at EEG. So that's kind of electrical signals from the brain and trying to target the window of this synaptic plasticity. Because we know, from animal studies, this might be kind of starting four hours following the ketamine dose, peaking about 24 hours. So it just sort of track the antidepressant effects, which is quite interesting. I think the idea, you know, for me as a psychologist is that you could time your psychological therapy when your brain is most plastic, most able to learn new things. And we know actually, you know, this kind of plasticity is impaired across a whole range of like sort of psychiatric disorders, so not just depression, but also in alcohol and addiction and, and trauma. So actually being able to stimulate the brain to kind of learn new things, well, it's really plastic, then actually giving some psychological therapy that uses that process, because we know that's what we're asking people to do really in psychological therapy is to think definitely about things, learn new ways of thinking about old problems. Um, so yeah, that's, that's to me, it seems like an intuitively appealing mechanism. I mean, there's some problems with it in that neuroplasticity happens from all sorts of things. So some might argue, you know, is this like specific enough as a process? Um, other drugs produce neuroplasticity that we wouldn't say were necessarily potential treatments for mental health problems and psychiatric disorders. So Such as. we need to find out more about it. Well, like cocaine. So people say the neuroplasticity produced from cocaine mm. is used, um, is why it becomes addictive. Like there's this kind of stimulation of that from an acute cocaine dose. So I do think we need to find out a bit more about it. And maybe it's down to something really specific and neurobiological. Um, so I leave that to my kind of preclinical researchers. But, but yeah, it's, a, it's fascinating. Now, now when, you think about, when you think about things like MDMA and psilocybin, mm. uh, the, the real a lot of the therapy takes place while under the influence of the drug, uh, whether it be for PTSD or depression. Um, is that happening also with ketamine when that patient is um, 
in the aftermath of the infusion or is that, are they basically just left alone during that period of time and the psychotherapy takes place immediately following, you know, the next day and the next day and the next day, trying to take advantage of them being less dysthymic? Yeah. I mean, in our work, certainly, and we wouldn't be trying to do any therapy under the influence of ketamine. I think people are too dissociated, you know, the memory is impaired. Mm -hmm. To me, that's, I know there are some ketamine therapists who do use this, what's called kind of psycholytic approach, which is where you use mild doses to be able to um, do some therapeutic process. There's a really interesting study actually from a guy, where is he? Um, in Texas, I think, like in one of the VAs. I had some correspondence with him. He's actually looking at complex PTSD, um, which is, you know, really severe, multiple traumas. And he was treating complex regional pain syndrome on top of that. So these are really traumatized people who've got like really severe pain. And he was giving continuous, very, quite low dose. Um, I can't exactly have the, my fingertips, the dose, but ketamine over 96 hours. So continuous infusion. Mm. And he was doing very kind of basic um, psychological therapy during that time and found massive reductions in you know, CAP score, which is our measure of PTSD symptoms, which I, I mean, it was a really small study, but I thought that was quite interesting approach. Um, but no, in, to answer your question, we do the therapy outside of that. And I think most people with ketamine do do that. I think really with psilocybin as well, even people would argue what you're doing in that, when they're having the acute experience is really just supporting them. Yeah, yeah, that, that's fair. And, the and, then, and then it's the integration afterwards where with yeah. psilocybin, yeah. Well, there's very little research on what integration is or what the key fundamentals are it's kind of accepted that it's this thing that you have to do <laughs> but i don't know we're kind of lacking in research from that side um but and what do yeah. we know about the brain under the influence of ketamine i mean have, have people done fmri or fdg pet and and kind of looked at either the metabolic state of the brain or the activity of the brain I mean, you've obviously yeah, mentioned I mean, the prefrontal cortex, but is it? Can we get even more granular than that? Are there certain sections of the uh, of the PFC that are more active than others? Yeah, there's. I mean, there's quite a lot of really interesting work. So there's the kind of, I guess, as you'd imagine, the default mode network, which is you know being. The, tell, tell folks something. what the default mode network is. It's very so important. It's kind of your. But it's basically what happens in your brain when you're not doing anything active. So when you're in a scanner and we don't give anyone anything to do, then that's a resting state scan. And you look at how the brain networks connect. So people say it's kind of, yeah, the task, the, the kind of background activity of the brain and have likened it to things like rumination, which we know are important in depression, which is like where you repetitively think about something. You can have positive rumination as well. You know, positive, repetitively think about something good, but repetitively thinking about something bad or kind of mind wandering. So that's where the default mode network has been kind of shown to be disrupted following psychedelics. So this kind of background, normal kind of chatter of your brain. And also similarly with things like mindfulness. So there've been studies looking at that. We mentioned the prefrontal cortex. There's some really interesting studies looking at prediction error signaling. So the idea that your brain is basically like making predictions all the time about the world. And that's how we understand everything perceptually. You know, we know that there's like whatever behind your computer screen, there's a world behind there. And I would predict that if I put my laptop screen down and found there was a gap in reality, <laughs> then I'd have a, like a massive shock of surprise because that would signal to my brain that I had to learn something new. So every time a prediction that we make based on our learning is violated, then you get this increase in learning and, and attention and activity in your brain. Um, and there's some work showing that ketamine basically disrupts. There's a bit of the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, so sort of in your prefrontal cortex, but a bit back and a bit to the side, um, that's really associated with this prediction error processing, and that's disrupted with ketamine. So things that aren't surprising become surprising. <laughs> the things that shouldn't be surprising and are completely predictable, and things that aren't predictable are no longer surprising. So basically kind of noisy signal, um, that I think it's like it's just quite an interesting way of understanding maybe the subjective experiences from a lot of these drugs that you turn off some of that kind of forward prediction from the brain and make a kind of a noisier signal. So I think that's quite interesting way to think about the subjective experiences. But yeah, I mean, there's quite a lot of neuroimaging work um, being done. I've yeah, we've done some of it as well, looking at kind of hippocampal function. And is the brain hypermetabolic? 
under the influence of ketamine? Um, I do, uh, hype. I think the idea is that it's more kind of hype, more hypo in some ways. Um, so mm. get an increase in sort of prefrontal glutamate. Um, and we know that as well because you get attenuated so, um, so in it and an increase in kind of prefrontal function. But then there's, yeah, so it's, I, don't, I don't know that that's particularly clear. Um, I guess, and the neuroimaging, as I've done it as a, as a method in the past, it's not my area of expertise. <laughs> so, yeah. How many patients do you think, um, when when relieved of their depression during these ketamine trips, um, will need to stay on ketamine as a long term treatment, and if so, at what frequency? Yeah, so I think I that's what's really frustrating in a way is that there's all of these ketamine clinics, as you mentioned, that have sprung up all across the U.S. We don't really have that in the UK because we have a state healthcare system. So in the UK, any patient who is receiving ketamine for depression is doing it through the NHS. It's paid for by the NHS. There's a couple of private clinics now um, that have sprung up uh, giving ketamine. So I'm involved with one actually, um, but there's, it's mainly, there's five centers prescribing on the NHS, but it's all off label um, because our state healthcare regulator have not recommended yet um spravato which is the kind of the intranasal ketamine for use and so there's no licensed ketamine for depression um so it's all prescribed for treatment resistant depression but if the physician prescribes it off label is it paid for still by nhs uh yeah in these some of these clinics yeah that have okay. sprung up yeah so there's um, maybe maybe five of those at the moment but yeah I think is is potentially there's a lot of data out there that we could be looking at, but we don't have a good registry of all the patients. So we don't, I think in answer to your question, there, yeah, there'll be a number of people that probably might respond. But, and we don't know what, in all of these clinics, my sense is that not everyone has treatment resistant depression. I think yep. particularly in the US, it's been given for a wide range of indications. I mean, I my guess in looking at the way it's being done in the US is there is no indication. The only indication no. is, do you want to pay for it? Yeah. And that's really, I mean, that's a bit, I guess there's kind of worrying signs there. Although, but yeah, I mean, that's why I think it would be amazing if we could have a kind of international registry way and we, we could look at, and then we could look at this data. We'd have the data to be able to say, you know, with this presentation, how long someone would likely be on ketamine. Um, because speaking from the trials data is is one thing, but actually... It's, it's already being given out there, you know, for, like you say, for all manner of things. So it's a shame because I think those data would be really helpful. And also it would add a level of kind of safety potentially for the patients and for the clinicians. Um, I know there's a couple of case reports of people going across state lines, Ketman seeking. Um, I don't think it's a huge problem because, I mean, but we don't know, right? So we must be mindful of the potential of these things. I've seen some slightly worrying trends recently. But I helped organize a Ketamine conference with some colleagues, um, some of them from the US. And uh, we had a few pharmaceutical companies coming in there developing Ketamine for oral daily dosing. Mm -hmm. um, to me, that's a bit of a worry, having worked you know, for 10 years researching Ketamine users, because I feel like if you, even if you're using very low oral daily dosing, you're going to have to dose escalate, right? Yeah. So where is the end point? And if you if you aren't giving it in a supportive therapy, is the idea that people are just on ketamine all the time? I don't know. To me, it seems a bit worrying. Maybe there's something I'm missing about the drug development pathway there. But <laughs> no, no, I don't. I mean, I'm going to just take the skeptic's point of view on that. I don't think you're missing anything. I think it's a land grab for a, a greater profit motive without mm. enormous consideration for the downside. Um, you know, so, so I, I mean, I, I would, I would share your, I don't know what it is about ketamine that has me sort of cautious. Um, mm. and maybe it's just the anecdotes and that's a bad, um, that's a bad frame, but, um, you, you know, it just, do you, is there, I mean, this is going to sound really silly, but do you, do you, do you have a sense, have you ever seen people with these sort of ketamine eyes, like these sort of sunken, distant, like, this person has taken too much ketamine in their life and their brain doesn't work as well anymore. And I think you can have that with, I'm sure there are lots of different drugs that can produce that phenotype. I'm sure somebody that's taken 
far too much cocaine can experience something. But, mm-hmm. but, there, but it, I, I think it has, it, it's something that you see more commonly, I would assume with ketamine than you would with LSD or psilocybin, because as you said, the frequency of use is much harder with those other drugs. Like mm. no one is going to, I mean, I shouldn't say no one, I'm some, someone can do anything, but it's far less likely that a person is going to take heroic doses of LSD or psilocybin over and over and over again. Whereas you could get down that path with ketamine. And mm. again, it's just anecdotal, but you know, you see some of these people where you, you get the concern. It's not just the bladder. I mean, the cystitis is a very obvious and, and, and tangible objective side effect that can be devastating. This is much more subtle. It's just something's changed in that person's brain and it's not for the better. Mm. So, so am I just sort of making this up and it's possible I am and that I'm, I'm just over extrapolating from something else, but have you, you've been around this more than almost anyone. Do you have a concern around that? Yeah, no, we've done a lot of studies on that as well. And I guess maybe, I don't know, we haven't studied the sunken eyes, <laughs> but we have looked yeah, at and the it's, brains. And it's not, it's, I mean, it sounds <laughs> silly to say it. It's not physically sunken, right? Like like you would with yeah. hypothyroidism. It's just, it's a vacancy is more what yeah. I'm describing. A kind of dullness. Yeah. And I mean, I guess like any addiction, one thing I noticed, and again, anecdotally, was just like a lack of, you know, when people lose their sense of humor, and that seems to be like a thing in addiction, it's like the the spark has gone out of life, which is odd, right? Because what we're giving ketamine for is it's quite a paradoxical drug in depression is to like put the spark back. But then it makes sense. You do it too much and maybe that spark is gone. And we found that, you know, cognitively, we found cognitive impairments and with planning. And we found actually um, reductions in, you know, your hippocampus, which is involved in processing novelty um and encoding memories and that's the function of that is reduced in some of our brain imaging studies with people who these are people who take daily heavy doses of ketamine so i'm not saying even your non-medical recreational user would show show this kind of symptoms so people who take it occasionally but yeah really 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 heavy doses i think that's possible um i don't know because seeing the way that it's administered in clinics i mean originally it was not never really the idea of it was a rapid acting antidepressant and i think the promise was that it's not a maintenance medication you know yeah. and how empowering that is for patients to not be on a daily medication and that's why i feel a bit sad that there's not more research effort going into looking at enhancing the antidepressant effect with therapy so we don't have to give people hundreds of doses of ketamine or maybe with some people will just need that. And that's a cost benefit analysis, I guess, you make when you're prescribing any drug, you know, because these, some of these people, you know, this is life threatening, right? Like people who are really heavily suicidal. So has anyone guess, done that study where you, because that's the closest way to get to a quality adjusted life year analysis, which is going to be that cost benefit analysis. Has anyone taken that group of patients who are the most treatment resistant and randomized them to continuing to try to treat even though it's resistant versus ketamine and looking at really hard outcomes like differences in suicide rate there's people who have definitely done work with patients with suicidal ideation yeah and you get reduced mortality with ketamine so i guess and they have randomized people which is i mean these are tough studies to do right yeah of course they're ethically difficult as well when you know that you have a treatment yeah really really difficult um and so just you know amazing um, just, yeah, amazingly in awe of the researchers doing that work because it's so important. So, so what does your intuition say is probably the sweet spot for what the intermittent, you know, call it transient, but fixed use of ketamine is as a bridge to go from completely treatment resistant to depression to treatable depression? Well, yeah, I mean, I'd, I guess my work's been with people with addiction. So maybe I, I could talk about that because I feel, you know, more able to speak just from our data. Mm. But there we used, as I was saying, like these three doses and seven. Three three doses spe- 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 um, um, separated by seven days each? Yeah, seven days to two weeks. Um, and then that was a 0.8 milligrams per kilogram. So it's quite a slightly higher dose than mm-hmm. in depression because you get a sort of cross tolerance with alcohol um because alcohol also works on the same receptor as ketamine at higher doses so that's you know when people get really intoxicated and feel like they're spinning out that's that's kind of your alcohol working on on your nmda receptors um 
So yeah, we use that three doses. And these, I mean, people with alcohol problems have depression as well and can be quite severely treatment resistant. What we found that I think is interesting is we were still seeing impacts on like reductions in rumination, which I meant that, that repetitive negative thinking and reductions in anhedonia, which is a hallmark of depression, but also across multiple disorders. And that's an inability to experience pleasure in the world. And um, so we saw reductions in that at three months, but they were back to baseline at six months, whereas they were still showing reductions in drinking, which is I thought was really interesting. So it might suggest like, certainly in depression, that maybe that would be the time, you know, so you have maybe weekly or fortnightly Jason. Yeah, because to me that 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 model makes a bit more sense if you if you could say look this is a treatment that you know you need to do once a once a quarter, you know, mm. every 3 yeah. months, you know, so you have a loading phase where you do the infusion weekly for 3 or 4 weeks and then you're on to kind of a quarterly schedule. Um that to me is very interesting. Uh, yeah. what's, what's less interesting to me and what I'm seeing certain people do is twice a week ketamine infusion for life. I mean, that, th yeah. that strikes me as, you, you know, a, I just, a, I worry about the toxicity of the drug and B I'm, it would have to really have an enormous efficacy to, to mm. justify it seems. Um, and, and, and yeah. I look at the short-term studies where they're comparing ketamine to Versed, like it's not that much better. Not that Versed is a good option, by the way, but you know, when you're using Versed as a control um, mm. and you're seeing, well, basically that's telling you there's a pretty big placebo effect from doing this as well. No, exactly. Oh, and I think it was spot on. I did, well, I mean, that's my intuition as well, is that I, this is an, a positive thing if we're maintaining people on this twice weekly, you know, for life. So tell me why you think it's working in addiction and, and, and do you primarily work in alcohol addiction or do you also look at opioid addiction? We want to look at opioid addiction as well. And actually there's some other work going on in the U S um, looking at opioid addiction. And this work dates back to some work by a Russian psychiatrist, Jenny Kropitsky, who did work with heroin addicts and found a similar, you know, dosing regime, which was just three infusions with this psychological therapy around it, produced reductions in heroin use at 12 months, you know, quite significant. Do, do you know how much? How much of a reduction? I know in alcohol, so there was a 40% reduction in relapse rate. At 12 months? In these Russian, at 12 months, yeah. And I what's mean, the control is, group, which I assume is doing, is the control group would, doing pharmacotherapy or behavioral therapy, such as 12-step They were. I mean, so this for context, this was in the 80s in Russia, they were inpatient alcoholics. And um, so they were locked in locked wards. So I remember saying to have Jenny, did anyone drop out? It's like, they can't drop out, mm -hmm. <laughs> they're locked in. So I think it wasn't in the normal consent and yeah. ethics processes we have now, um, but still a really important study. And both groups had a hundred people in. And so, and it wasn't, you know, it wasn't a randomized control trial. He asked people if they wanted to be in this ketamine and psychotherapy group. So, so I'm sorry, stand. I'm not sure I understand the trial. You have an inpatient trial where the, well, all the patients trial. are given, yeah, trial in quotes. It's, this, this, <laughs> yeah. this would constitute a dodgy trial. Um, yeah, this is dodgy. <laughs> there you go. So, so, so <laughs> it's inpatient and they're all given unlimited access to ac alcohol. But they're no, 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 no. They're not. They don't have. So any how do we know? How do we know what the relapse <laughs> rate is? No, so they do, they have to do their detox. Uh -huh. They get given their ketamine treatment. They're discharged. Oh, okay. And then when followed up at oh, 12 Oh, oh months, I see. So they're out, they, yeah. they behave as outpatients, but they're not allowed to drop out. In other words, if you drop out the KGB, bring you back. Well, in. yeah, they couldn't drop out of the treatment. Yeah. I was, uh, what I was asking him about was like, do people tolerate the treatment well? Yeah. Well, they just did the treatment. Yeah, I got it. I <laughs> so see. I guess, okay. you know, yeah, yeah, okay. um, <laughs> yeah, they didn't get like chopped by the KGB, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So they were a really important study. So yeah, I've only asked people if they wanted to have this, it was kind of like group psychodynamic psychotherapy with mm -hmm. just three infusions of ketamine. He was using higher doses. So around an, an intramuscular to one to two milligrams per kilogram. Got so it. yeah, quite strong. So, but we haven't done the head to head of ketamine plus behavioral therapy versus pharmacologic plus behavioral therapy for alcohol. No, we haven't. I've done ketamine plus therapy plus compared to ketamine with a kind of therapy control. Yes. Compared to placebo and therapy compared to placebo. So I did our four 
arm trial. Okay, so tell us yeah, about I mean, that. Tell, tell us about that trial. Oh, yeah, so that's the one that, I mean, it's been, so yeah, what we found, I mean, which was great because that's what we hypothesized and that's quite rare. I wasn't expecting to get what we hoped for was that we saw the strongest or greatest reductions in drinking and, and greatest abstinence in our ketamine and therapy group. And it's 86% abstinent at, at, at rates at um, six months. And then the second best effect was in our ketamine and education control. So we wanted to look at the effect of therapy, ketamine with and without therapy, but there's really mm. non-specific effects of just spending hours with a therapist. Yes. It's quite nice. So we would put the kind of, we concocted this. I mean, it's a bit like medication management, which is yeah, used yeah. in a lot of the US trials. So, so tell me about what, that's a, that's a, that's a very elegant trial um, design because you get away from what's called the performance bias of the therapy, right? The, the, the therapy itself, you have to make sure you're, you're controlling for just the fact that an hour, three times a week, they have to go talk to somebody. And so the question yeah. is, what, so, so tell me what they do in the education arm of that. Yeah, so we wanted to, so that we wanted it to be. I mean, it's not blind, right? I think for most people, but some people thought they'd had the therapy, <laughs> so that's quite positive because um, you can't. That's another issue is that you can't really blind for psychotherapy. But um, people were doing kind of calculations about alcohol, talking about how alcohol affects the body, and we did some relaxation. Hmm. But just as we thought, as a bare minimum of what we wanted so to do with people going into like a ketamine session, you know, a ketamine yeah, yeah. infusion was to have a bit of a relaxation um, control. So I think maybe the relaxation helps with the blinding, but yeah, no, we were pleased with the design. I mean, it's- And then did, for the non-ketamine group, did they get Versed or what type of a control do they get? What's the placebo? The same, so they, where they got, no, they got, they just got saline basically. Oh, so no dissociative effects. No, I know, which is a bit of a, sh a shame um, in retrospect. We should have used something, yeah, like midazolam or yeah. the DL of, you know, Z, but we just used the saline placebo. Okay. So it's, I mean, we nevertheless. So it's a, it's a, it, but it's still a very elegant two by two study, perhaps only limited mm. by the fact that the control didn't get some sort of active substance. Um, yeah. But nevertheless, at 12 months, or sorry, at six months, you said that the double positive group, double positive meaning ketamine plus actual psychotherapy dedicated towards alcohol reduction. Did you say 86% mm. were still alcohol free at six months? Abstinence rates, yeah, which is good really. I mean, we, we were really impressed and then there was- And I then mean, what about in the other three groups? Res the response were quite good in all of the groups, but it was statistically significantly different. So that's, you know, what we care about as researchers, although it was um, a small, I mean, it was 96 patients. It didn't feel like a small trial. There's only 24 patients per arm. So we weren't powered for the really for the full interaction. But we're actually we're taking it forward now into a phase three with 280 patients. So that's good. Again, funded by the UK state, which is great. So we get to run it in NHS settings and hopefully see it as a medicine, you know, in those in those contexts. Because one thing, I mean, I don't know what you think of the psychedelics world, but um, and I think some of the therapies are amazing. But for our state healthcare system, those things are not ever going to happen. You're never going to have two therapists for 40 hours, you know. So I wanted to come up with a therapy that was deliverable in our state healthcare system. Because, you know, I mean, there's certainly, it's a great idea that you could do have that kind of system. But we've got, we have had, we've got these kind of slightly lower level trained therapists. And there's a lot of them in the NHS here. And so we designed our therapy to be quite, manualize so that they could deliver it um and it take a, a, a short amount of time so, so how much really therapy pleased. how much therapy were they getting in the active so they therapy get about it only about in total about 11 hours in six months yeah so they just get they get it for the treatment part and i do think that you know like oh so just in those in, in those first three weeks or two weeks when they're getting it's it's three they doses separated dose, yeah by seven days yeah for um for a total so they have a therapy session before their infusion, immediately before. Mm -hmm. And so if they were in the therapy group, they would be doing kind of mindfulness practice. And then in the education group, there's some relaxation and then they have the ketamine session and then they just recover, you know, as you would from an anesthetic and they go home, come back the next day where we think the peak of the, um, the kind of synaptic plasticity effects are. Mm -hmm. And they have another, so these are longer sessions yeah. of an hour and a half therapy.
And they, so it's kind of a ketamine infusion sandwich between two therapy sessions. And they repeat that three times. What is the therapist talking about? I don't really know much about alcohol addiction, but so, so when you, like in particular, when that patient comes in the day after their first ketamine infusion, when they're, as you said, at their maximum neuroplasticity, what, I mean, I, I assume the therapist has a very clear playbook for how mm -hmm. they want to work with that patient in that 90 minute block. What, what's in that playbook? I'm saying some of it's very pragmatic, you know, things like what are your most risky situations for drinking, like trying to preempt um, situations where they might relapse. But some of it's more about how you want to live your life and the values you want to embody. Um, so trying to think about thinking about your life without alcohol, how would you structure that? And there's some, yeah, things about thinking about your thinking around drinking, which is more kind of cognitive behavior therapy mm -hmm. based. What are your thinking biases? Let's identify those and then planning. So they have quite a lot of activities to do in the week or weeks in between the sessions. You know, what I guess like standard homeworks, but planning their days, journaling, um, keeping track of those things. We teach kind of mindfulness techniques to enable people to deal with the cravings, um, to get a bit more of a space between them and their kind of addictive impulses. So yeah, there's a whole range of stuff really. We through the book of the evidence-based therapies at them and so but it's the very oh sorry go ahead yeah no 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 you go ahead <laughs> no no i was i was just gonna ask you tell me about the inclusion criteria i mean obviously you're dealing with a patient who's motivated who says i want to stop drinking and mm -hmm. then they they actually come and do a pre-infusion therapy session is there anything that in that session the therapist says we're not going to include this patient like is there is there another decision that's made of a go, no go based on that pre-infusion session? Well, the go, no go is normally made before that. So they had to go through like a number of screenings basically to get as, as is with a clinical trial, which is kind of a problem with clinical trials that we end up with quite pure populations, but we needed people to be abstinent when they started. As we were talking about right at the beginning, you know, with a lot of people who are drinking, they can't stop straight away. So they either need to go through a medical detox, detox and, yeah. in yeah. most cases. Or, you know, supervise. Most of those are in the community now. So you can work with people's healthcare providers to um, support them as they're doing that. So we keep checking in with them until they're ready to start. So normally maybe two weeks after, if they've done a full detox. If someone's drinking really heavily, but we're at, they're at levels that we think, you know, we can help them, support them cut down over a four-week period, we would do that. So there'd normally be a kind of pre-screening where we check all the medical um, contraindications for people and psychiatric ones. So we don't include people with psychosis or psychosis in a first degree relative, people with re uncontrolled blood pressure because of ketamine increasing your, like say uncontrolled hypertension because ketamine increases your blood pressure and a variety of other things. Um, we would exclude people from the study um, and then we have to access kind of their medical notes. And so, yeah, it's quite a process, <laughs> but the main bit is getting people abstinent. And so when, so this all, the therapy is all around, like, you know, supporting people with their new life and giving, using the ketamine experience really to get that perspective, um, a perspective they might not have had for a while, a kind of new perspective to think about their life in a new way um, and try and focus on how they want to go forward, really. So it's really um, using the ketamine as a catalyst for the therapy rather than purely focusing on the pharmacological properties of it. And, and uh, remind me, how much does blood pressure go up in that type of a therapy when you're at 0.8 megs per kg? What's the raise? What's the increase in systolic and diastolic blood pressure? I don't know. It really varies. So some people are really minimal. Some people like it goes up about 10, um, I guess. I'm, I'm trying to think. Um, as a psychologist, I guess we have anesthetist there oh, okay. <laughs> for the whole yeah. thing. So they're probably checking that. Yeah. And there was someone we had to stop the infusion because it went above, I think it went over 180. Oh. Um, so, but that was, that's pretty rare. And that's, you know, why we, we, we do exclude people. But then my anesthetist colleagues say, you know, if we're people in theater, we just give them ketamine perspective of this. They're, they're quite, a, you know, they're, I guess because of the way, and if just the people that kill you, right? Ultimately, if all the medical professionals do want to, they're quite um, yeah, desensitized, I guess, to risk. Whereas we're like, oh. Right, right. <laughs> so so yeah. again, tell me what the response rate was in the double negative group. So the group that didn't get the ketamine and 
only got the education, but without therapy. What was their six month? And was like still, I mean, really high. So about six, just sixty eight percent, I think. How? What do you attribute that to? So that means there's a twenty percent difference between the two the two extremes, which is still yeah. great. But how yeah. do you attribute a sixty eight percent non drink or an abstinence rate in people that didn't get ketamine and didn't really even get therapy? They just mm. sat down and talked with somebody about alcohol biochemistry. Yeah, I get. Yeah, I mean, and it is. Not, I think that was pretty extraordinary for any clinical trial and we did have a really lovely team so i partly put it down to that i think you know that's something you see in clinical trials people just do better a because they they've gone through this whole rigmarole of process with this really strong intention to stop you know so they've been through quite a lot of hurdles that the trial was pretty demanding so you know if you stuck with it we also had things which i hadn't mentioned like um we had a scram i don't know if you've ever seen them they're used in criminal justice um, more Lindsay Lohan had to wear one when she had some DUIs. Oh, yeah. It's basically like a tag yep. that you put around your ankle yep. that measures your um, alcohol through transdermally because you excrete about 1% of alcohol in sweat. So there were things that we were using to measure alcohol that might have actually acted as an intervention on their own. And you know, the fact that you have to go over, it wasn't, now we're using a much more discreet wearable, wait, but then this really clunky thing, you know, you had to say, you're not going to do swimming for six months, you know, all these things. I think that in itself was an intervention. Yep. Um, but also just be, you know, a lot of these people don't have a lot of social connections. Some of them did. But the fact of having people looking after them, checking in on them all the time, you know, repeatedly measuring, like people just showing you general human kindness, I think can have a, obviously a really positive effect in a group that might be quite isolated. Yeah, I mean, that that's amazing. I mean, that, I think these are really <laughs> kind of staggering insights because you have <clears throat> everything from the monitoring of compliance to just the interaction. It, I, I don't say any of this to diminish the fascination I have in both two components of this, one being the effect of the ketamine and therapy producing 88% abstinence at six months, mm -hmm. but also just looking at the control group and realizing it didn't take much to move the needle. And what can we learn from that sort of more big picture? It, it's a bit of a sad statement. It really is. Yeah. I mean, I think our alcohol services here in the UK are just so dysfunctional at the moment you have to you know people by the time they get to any sort of treatment people that are re really seriously complexly you know with multiple health problems well people have been through multiple treatments and they've not worked i don't know and, and it's really hard to access therapists so it's like multiple things just like oh yeah it's really sad it doesn't actually take that much to shift something that's pretty entrenched you know but well the other yeah. thing too is um it makes me wonder about less responsive cohorts down the line where you would expect the response rate to be lower. But let's say you took an individual who's less interested in not drinking. You know, I mean, mm. I, I don't think you could treat someone who says, I'm going to keep drinking, but someone who maybe hasn't fully hit rock bottom, but says, you know, yeah, maybe I'm drinking too much. And yeah, I probably meet the criteria for being an alcoholic, but but I haven't destroyed my life yet. You know, I just I just sort of wonder if you have these places for earlier intervention as someone is on the path towards, mm. um, you know, really destructive alcoholism. So so a lot a lots here. So in the phase three, obviously mm. you said two hundred plus patients. So that's going to be great. You're still going to do the same four arms. Well, actually, I mean, it's funded by the NHS, the Department for Health here. So we've gone down to take the two most extreme arms. Um, ideally, I mean, in an ideal world of infinite resource, I would definitely have the four arms because I really like that design. Mm -hmm. And I think something that's really missing from the broader psychedelics world is teasing apart the impact of the therapy and the drug. But um, I think we felt, speaking to clinicians, so we've got like a patient advocacy group involved from the start that actually given potentially the, you know, some of the risks with ketamine that we wouldn't really want to give it without a therapeutic container. So having found these promising effects for this efficacy study, which is more of a definitive study, then we will just take the most extreme arms. But yeah, so we're, we're looking just with the therapy and then, you know, the various other more discrete wearables compared to our um, placebo, but we're using a, a low dose ketamine this time um, instead um, to manage expectancy. 
And so what will that what will that low dose be? Will the high dose still be 0.8 megs per kilogram? Yeah, and the low dose is low, like 0.05. We're sort of working out with some piloting, but and why is that? Because at point at the not 0.5, they will or point not five actually they'll experience nothing. Yeah, yeah. Right. I mean, they shouldn't feel anything. Yeah, not really anything. We've done some other studies, I and mean, we've done some studies with morphine and um, childhood trauma. So looking at people's you know, we've, I mean, that's a completely different area of research, but um, looking at how childhood trauma seems to sensitize the brain to the to respond to opiates. Mm-hmm. Um, and there we found actually using a very low dose morphine was kind of a better control than another drug. So I think it is actually helpful in expectancy. So you tell people you're getting, you're it. getting, you're getting the two drug doses no matter of what. Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 So. And then also because we had patients actually drop out because well two patients because they thought you know they knew that they hadn't got the ketamine they yes. hadn't got the active mm-hmm. so we're saying you're getting one of two doses of ketamine it's kind of easier yeah, yeah. to maintain people in that I the feel. other thing is yeah. you might be able to recruit some kgb offers to uh, kgb officers to help with that uh, that dropout rate yeah, exactly no one drops out yeah. <laughs> So no, we're not doing any dodgy, <clears throat> dodgy stuff. <laughs> no, 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 no. This, this is not a, this is a non-dodgy trial. Non-dodgy. Um, <laughs> um, so what's your, what's your, uh, there's one other thing I want to talk about before we, 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 we wrap this up. So I want to, but I want to sort of put a bow on the ketamine story. Um, <laughs> what would you say to people here in the U S right? So where, where ketamine clinics are ubiquitous. And as far as I can tell, I think you can just walk into them. I don't think you need a referral. I don't think you need a medical referral to go to a ketamine clinic. Um, although I think there are therapists who do make referrals and say, look, this is mm-hmm. a reputable clinic. And I'm sure that there are many reputable clinics. And, you know, your depression is recalcitrant or, um, mm. you know, you're having this problem in your life and I think it could get better here. So I, so I suspect that there's a, a really good conduit of therapists sending patients appropriately to good ketamine clinics. But let's also posit that anybody can walk into a ketamine clinic, which I I really do believe is true, um, and sort of tell the persons there, hey, I'm having this issue, I want to do it. But there's a bit of a conflict in that model because when you walk into the clinic, they're sort of incentivized to do what they do, right? When you're a hammer, everything's a nail. Mm -hmm. When you're a ketamine clinic, you're incentivized to give ketamine. how would you caution people around ketamine uh, use liberally in that context? I suppose I'd say that it's the evidence, you know, that we've gathered, and not just us, there's an, another group at Yale, Sam Wilkinson has looked at, you know, therapy and ketamine, and there's another trial starting in depression, is that actually it's a bit of a waste if you just if you just do the ketamine you should certainly try it embedded within therapy and you probably don't need, you know, all of those doses. I think interrogating what you're trying to get out of that experience and that actually it's, you know, I think it's, it's, that's great to hear that therapists refer people to ketamine clinics. Like we've got so far with therapy, then we're going to use this as a boost so we can continue the therapy. To me, that just seems much more appealing model because really do people want to, I don't think people want to be kind of stuck on a drug, even if you're not, you know, addicted, yeah. but you're going in twice a week or even once a week. Like that's so disempowering for patients. We know that, right? And speaking to patients, one of the things they said was great about that our treatment approaches, you know, rather than being on daily meds, or things like other treatments and alcohol, like the campus say you have to take three times a day. They feel pretty liberated, you know, and they know they're doing the healing themselves which I think is a really important part of the process. So I'd say, yeah, get, get kind of get a therapist, think about using a really minimal number of doses. I mean, I do, um, yeah, it's, it's worrying. There's some really worrying practices that you hear about, you know, some mail order ketamine clinics. I don't really worry about them from the abuse side. Maybe I'm wrong not to, but just because it's so expensive, I think, <laughs> unless you're, you know, you have to have a lot of money to be able to afford that's ketamine. I just, but I just think it works well, unsafe because if you certainly don't take ketamine at home when you're not supervised, you know, this drug makes you completely dissociated from your environment. If you, if something happens, there's a fire or, and it, all sorts of things could happen. You can't take it unsupervised, but I think there's a lack of kind of clinical care and supervision in some of these models. Um, that, yeah, I find that really worrying. 
but it's expensive as well. <laughs> so so yeah, you, you, you sort of answered what my next question was going to be, which was not at all to, to say, do you condone the, the use of, of, of non-medical or recreational ketamine, but more to say, if someone is going to use ketamine recreationally, what, what, is the, <clears throat> what is the instruction set you provide them to make sure that they don't harm themselves psychologically and physically? So one of them is, I, if I'm just going to extrapolate, it's like, if people are going to do ketamine recreationally, there really needs to be somebody around watching them, right? You can't, yeah. you can't trust yourself to be under the influence of this drug, at least at a high dose, which I'm guessing based on what we've said is, you know, depending on your size, hundred to 200 milligrams would be considered a high dose. Uh, yeah, really high. And I think, you know, start really small doses and I guess is the advice that you would always give to people with any non-medical use of a drug. Yeah. And do it in a, you know, safe place with someone who's not under the influence of any substances and start with a small dose. But yeah, I mean, it's not, I don't know so much them in the U S you rarely get ketamine, particularly cut with other things, but it can happen. So there's something to be careful of as well. Wow. Like, that's interesting. What would it typically be cut with? I don't have people, I mean, there are ketamine analogs, which people have shown. So there's a drug methoxetamine. Um, so they're the kind of research chemicals that have come out of labs in China, Israel. Um, so it's an analog of ketamine, but it's got studies have shown more toxicity of the bladder, um, and slightly maybe higher abuse potential, but yeah, typically, I mean, I, yeah, I don't, I don't think it's, it's normally particularly cut with things, but it's something to be mindful of and why it's really important to take a small dose, you know, but ideally, yeah, obviously I think cautionary non-medical use. Well, Celia, that's, I mean, this is super interesting. I mean, this is, I, I've sort of been deliberately sort of ignorant of ketamine. I don't know why I've, I've sort of gone down the rabbit hole and trying to understand as much as possible about these other, uh, agents, which ironically are tend to be the one that are schedule one and therefore not really readily available for clinical use outside of trials. We do have many clinical trials here in the United States looking at in particular, the use of psilocybin and MDMA, um, but, but ketamine has been a bit of a black box to me. And yet it's the one that I probably have seen the most people use because of mm. course it can be used legally. Um, so I found, I found this discussion very helpful. I found this discussion really insightful. Um, and it, it sort of, uh, clarified for me a lot of the, the use case, the neurobiology, the risks, and, and perhaps most importantly, what the promise of this agent is. Um, so I want to thank you for your time. And again, I know it's late there in the UK at the moment. And, uh, and more importantly, I think, thank you for the work you're doing. This is really fascinating. Uh, and I, and I, I kind of love the model. Oh, thanks for having me, Peter. <laughs> Thank you.